At every level, the planet of Nakari 1011C has seen many Earthling species evolve and adapt to a new environment light years away from Earth. In just 5 million years, many animals have adapted into a variety of strange and unique forms, and this series will be dedicated to providing a window to this world of unguided evolution and natural history. Welcome to the abandoned world of Parias. In this episode, we take ourselves to the western continent of Lucindo and more significantly examine the boreal forests of its southern edge. This portion of the continent is unique in two ways. For one, it is the only portion of the landmass that exists in Parias' Antarctic Circle. Because of the extreme 35 degree axial tilt of the planet, the southern region of Lucindo experiences the phenomenon of midnight sun, or well, in this case, midnight suns. Summers in this part of the world have days dominated by sunlight where night is absent, and winters have entire days where the sun does not rise. This can cause extreme seasonal variation, but is often cold for most of the year, with snowfall often landing in this region in the dark of winter. The second important geographic feature to take into consideration is the high plateaus to the north of this bioregion. These large, high flatlands cause a large barrier for ground-dwelling animals, blocking many species from opening available niches. Despite these challenges, however, life, of course, finds a way. When the ancient ice fields melted away soon after humans left Parias, the whole region was open for life to colonize, fill new niches, and thrive. One of the first and arguably strangest groups to adapt to this cold region is the colonial aspen, a species of aspen tree that eventually grew to dominate the region. It may seem surprising that a rather humble tree species would single-branchedly become the top tree in a whole bioregion, but their secrets lie under the surface. Much of their success can be attributed to their colonial lifestyle. All aspen trees in these colonies are duplicates of each other, and all trees in a colony connect their root systems in a tangled up mess. These roots have a mutually beneficial relationship with a special fungus species that has specialized to being symbiotic to the aspen trees, which help in the gaining of nutrients and the timing of abscission in the autumn. Because of them, the entire colony's leaves will turn yellow and dump in almost perfect synchrony. On top of this amazing adaptation, these trees, similarly to eusocial insects, have adapted a caste system surrounding a single queen aspen tree. The queen is guarded by a ring or two of guard trees, with gnarled roots and stems that make access to the center of the colony more trouble than is worth for herbivores. This protection ensures the continuation of a colony, as the death of a queen means a swift end for the rest of the colony. Due to this system, the colonial aspen evolved to rapidly take over stretches of land that other large trees could not cover as quickly, carving out a niche all to themselves. Whilst the colonial aspen has become the dominant tree of their region, they are not the only plants to call these extreme lands home. Some species of crabgrass have also evolved to live in this strange territory, adapting into two unique genera that cope differently to the harsh conditions. Monover grass, much as their name implies, are annual grasses that will produce massive amounts of seeds in the autumn, only for them to die when winter rolls in. The seeds lie dormant until spring comes, the cue of which will trigger the seeds that made it through winter to grow and continue the cycle all over again. Polyver grasses, on the other hand, take more time in a more long-lived approach, growing more slowly and saving resources in their roots under the ground. When winter comes, the resources gathered from summer sunlight and stored away will carry the plant through the winter allowing it to live for more than a year. A significant flowering plant of the region can be seen growing in the shadows of the great aspen colonies. Simple patches of year bloom blanket flower grow in the spring and summer, spreading across the region and taking advantage of the long summers for fast growth. The descendants of Indian blanket flower, these plants are one of the most beautiful flowers in the region. However, when winter rolls around, these plants will also die, in similar way to the monover grass, but many of their seeds will survive and regrow into the next generation when spring comes. 
These flowers come in an incredible range of diverse colors, often in stark contrast to the lush greens of spring and summer. Other simple, ground-dwelling plants exist in the region as well. Other simple ground-dwelling plants exist in the region, many of which have similar adaptations that allow them to survive the long winters. The Lucindan common moss and the great wood moss are plants that have not changed much from their ancestors, but both are hardy enough to survive the conditions, with spores or other adaptations that allow them to thrive. However, a unique species that shares a common ancestor with the Lucindan common moss has taken to the trees. Hanging moss can be found across most of southern Lucindo, thriving and exploring the branches up above. When the time comes for them to reproduce, they produce a bunch of spores on their hanging body in the hopes that an insect or bird will touch it and spread the spores to another tree. Hanging moss isn't the only plant that took to the trees in becoming epiphytic. Evercreep tomatoes have become a key part of the ecosystem as well. These bizarre descendants of domestic tomatoes have become an ivy-like epiphytic plant, spending the majority of its life on the branches of colonial aspen trees. It has done this due to competition with ground-dwelling species, as those more effectively take up the ground space of southern Lucindo. Some species of these tomatoes have adapted to being parasitic in nature, siphoning nutrients from their host to allow them to grow faster. This tomato descendant has evolved smaller and less acidic fruits, allowing for easier consumption via birds or insects. When the bird eats the tomato, there's a high likelihood that the seeds will pass the digestive tract of the bird and end up on the branch of a new tree, allowing the circle of life for these strange plants to continue. Coming back down to the ground, a humble fern can be detected among the aspens. The ever fern is a small and slow-growing species of fern that has adapted for a harsher climate, using nutrients that would have assisted in a growing taller to store away for the long winter. These nutrients produced via photosynthesis are found all over the plant body, which would make this plant a delectable target for large herbivores. Thankfully, this plant has adapted to have a scale-like exterior that makes consumption rather difficult. All of these plants have adapted to the region well, but many other life have also adapted to the harsh conditions of the southern polar circle to exploit the new environment. Many of these animals migrated from the land to the east, bypassing the Lucindan high plateaus in the process. Just as the plants have adapted to this climate, the fungal life have also adapted in unique ways to survive. They haven't changed as much during this time, as much of their lifespans occur in the soil. However, they do deserve being documented just like the other forms of life on Parias, as they too fill essential roles in the ecosystem that they find themselves in. The spotted Nepsa, much like the colonial aspen reigning supreme in the region, have become the dominant form of fungal life. The spotted nepsa is a couple of species within a genus that contains fungi that thrive due to their symbiotic relationship with the colonies of aspen trees. Whilst being symbiotic, they are not exclusively so, providing other services such as consumers of dead organic material. Their fruit bodies are often eaten by animals as they are very much edible, which helps with the distribution of their spores. Another fungal species that has adapted to this region is known as the snakeskin rot, and thrives across South Lucindo. Being able to metabolize lignin, this fungus is essential for quickly getting rid of dead or dying aspen trees. They have adapted to survive the winters by slowing metabolism rates, and can be easily spotted by showing a scaly appearance on the log that is being consumed. This humble coloration can allow for them to sometimes get an animal to touch their fruit bodies and disperse it elsewhere, allowing for this species to propagate itself. Not found in just southern Lucindo, but across most of the continent is the common shine shroom. This agaric descendant hasn't changed too much from their ancestors, but have made a unique adaptation that can allow them to disperse with greater efficiency. 
Their fruit bodies have intense amounts of chemicals that induce psychedelic effects on the consumer. Under the cap of this mushroom lies a large amount of spores, with at least some of them making it through the guts of whatever's eating them and being distributed through their droppings. Whilst not the most glorious method of dispersal, it is effective as many animals will eat this shine shroom species to gain euphoric feelings and pain relief. Not all species in this region are as generalist as the shine shroom or key to the environment as the snakeskin rot. The hidden in flower is not a plant, but a fungus species, descendants of the cinnamon polypore that has adapted to be a parasite of the evercreep tomato. When the host is infected, the species will bore into the veins of the tomato host and grow a large flower-like fruiting body. These flower-mimicking mushrooms rely on the pollinator confusing its fruiting body from the actual flowers of the tomato plant. When chosen over the real plant, the pollinator will get spores all over themselves and spread the infection from plant to plant, allowing the parasitic fungus to continue their harsh circle of life. Hidden among the mosses and grass are a humble entourage of small animal life that call this region home. Whilst these invertebrates may not be as charismatic as some of the larger and more dangerous creatures, they also deserve to be mentioned in this episode. After a gentle brush of rain has blown over the aspen forests, one can often see a common loosened worm squirm across the soil. Spending most of their time underground eating decaying material in the soil, they have not changed significantly from their ancestors. These worms just happen to be more resilient to seasonal variation. A key adaptation that has allowed these worms to stretch their range across half a continent is their ability to secrete a mucus that coats their body, acting as a protective coating against the cold of winter. This allows many worms to survive when the conditions get better, given they aren't disturbed in this state. Moving slowly across damp moss beds, polar snails thrive in the warm and wet summers that bask the region. The polar snail has adapted a similar survival strategy to the Lucindan common worm, but take it a unique step further. These snails, when autumn comes and the days get cut short, will eat more than they usually do and mate before finding a place to undergo hibernation. In this state, these snails will incubate their eggs right next to them, with the parent snail sharing the goopy winter blanket with the next generation of snails. When spring rolls around, the young snails will leave their parent to continue the strange and slow circle of life. Of course, not every animal has similar adaptations to survive the long and harsh winters of these regions. One group that has uniquely adapted for this environment is the jade wood beetle, Given that many wood-boring species of insects were not taken to Prius, some beetles have adapted to fill that vacant niche. The larvae of this beetle species will burrow deep into trees, preferring dead over living ones. When they become adults, the beetles will search for mates and lay as many eggs as possible before winter comes. When winter does arrive, the adults will die as the larvae remain dormant under the bark until winter clears away. Being one of the most successful clades of animals, a bee descendant has made the transition to survive in this climate. The adorably named cuddle bee is named such for its hibernation behavior in winter. In the spring and summer, the hive of these eusocial insects pollinate the flowers mentioned previously, preferring the blanket flower over other species. When winter comes along and their food supply is gone, these bees will close off most of their hive and group up pushing together like sardines. As they vibrate their abdomens, their body heat will ensure that the queen survives and can continue to lead the colony. As many organisms have adapted to survive the harsh winter, some have evolved to simply leave for warmer grounds and come back when the cold recedes. The lanternfly, a large descendant of the firefly, has become a true sight to behold. Over seven centimeters in length when fully grown, these insects have opted for a longer lifespan. They avoid the short fate of the jade wood beetle with migratory behavior. When autumn hits, the lanternflies will glow to alert others of their species that it's time to go. Eventually, they will fly northward in gargantuan swarms, thousands strong in number. 
The swarms will eventually land north, where they feast in a climate not as ravaged as their southern homelands. Lanternflies will mate in the autumn before leaving, and the firefly larvae will lay in dormancy. When the swarms come back south to mate again, a new generation of lanternflies will join the elders and replenish any lost along the way. Another species that tends to migrate is the polychrome streamhawk, the descendant of a dragonfly that live mostly in the plateaus to the north, but will come down to the more humid environment of South Lucindo. However, since their eggs are more adapted for surviving warmer waters, populations down here are not significant in comparison to their homeland. Despite this, they are prolific predators that can take down anything their size or smaller with deathly efficiency. Given that this part of the world isn't their homeland, we are going to cover these lovely insects in much more detail in a future episode. However, the true queens of the invertebrate world are the Lucindan fur spiders. Being the descendant of the jumping spider, they have undergone the most extreme changes by any of the life listed so far. The first adaptation is a more intense coating of a fur-like structure, allowing the spider to easily adapt to this environment. Due to the lack of competition from other spiders or arthropods, they have grown in size from their ancestors to exploit the apex predator role of the undergrowth. Their gigantism has also been a useful adaptation for surviving the cold environment, as larger animals do better in colder climates as they don't lose heat as fast. However, this large size means that their ancestral hunting and hiding strategies don't work as well, even given the lower gravity of pariahs. To counter this, they have evolved to dig small burrows and use ambush tactics to dispatch prey. These tactics of ambush hunting are so effective that they can often take down prey even larger than they are, which is impressive given that they are already the size of a softball. The rivers, ponds, and lakes of this realm are common and pocket the lands of South Lucindo like Swiss cheese. Due to the massive ice sheets melting away only 5 million years ago, many freshwater bodies were left behind as remnants of their icy forces. Given how new these lakes and rivers are in the region, many animals had to recently adapt to the situation here, which has resulted in a pretty low amount of diversity. The thin goby, or Gracioli, is a family of fishes that thrive across most of the rivers and estuaries across the continent of Lucindo, and especially here in the rivers of South Lucindo. Their adaptive nature and small size has allowed them to diversify into a variety of species and genera, from the humble 5 cm spotted thin goby to the 40 cm blue skin thin goby. Most of the species are adaptable omnivores, eating anything they can fit in their mouths. Another goby species has specifically adapted to the region. The common ice fry has adapted to live further upriver and thrive in creeks and streams and small lakes. Their small bodies and rapid life cycle allows them to quickly colonize waters that they find themselves in. On top of this, they have adapted a fairly unique adaptation that allows them to survive the winters better. They have adapted an antifreeze agent in their blood, like the ice fish of Earth. Because of this, they can do just fine in the cold of winter, even when the surface of the lakes and rivers above them freeze over. They thrive in aquatic algae and plant material, but might attack worms and small insects unfortunate enough to get into the waters when given the chance. However, a close relative of the common ice fry has adapted for a more aggressive role compared to their algae-loving cousins. Living upriver but occasionally coming down to brackish waters, these fish have adapted to a predatory role. The eel goby has adapted a row of sharp teeth which allows them to easily eat common ice fry, worms, snails, and anything else they can catch. They sometimes even eat small rodents and birds unfortunate enough to find themselves near the water's edge. They have a lengthened body, and given that their ancestors lack scales due to neoteny, the eel goby has thick skin that allows them to slime their way into nooks and crannies. However, these eel-like fish aren't the only ones who predate these waters. The swamp moray is the dominant fish in fresh and brackish waters of South Lucindo. 
and their length of around 130 centimeters as adults makes them the largest freshwater fish in the whole area. These eels recently migrated into the area from up north, and the key to their survivability in the freshwater streams and lakes is due to a high amount of osmoregulatory cells. These specialized cells keep the body at balance in both salt and fresh water. They eat other fish and aquatic arthropods and anything else they can catch. Sometimes, due to the high amounts of osmoregulatory cells, these eels will sometimes come onto land and migrate from one body of water to another. They can only last on dry land for a few dozen minutes before they dry out and die. Whilst these fish have adapted to stay in these small, fresh waters for their whole lives, other fish will use the lengthened summers to spawn upriver and go back out to warmer ocean water in the winters. The largest fish in the region are the titanic shielded sturgeon. The large descendants of Atlantic sturgeon, they have adapted uniquely to become one of, if not the largest benthic feeder on Piraeus. They feed on mollusks, crustaceans, worms, and detritus. Their keratinous armor makes them almost impervious to predation, especially when fully grown. This armoring is mostly covered at the head region of the animal, almost resembling the long extinct placoderms of Earth. The species is sexually dimorphic, with males being smaller yet more armored than the females. Females of the species gain sexual maturity at 25 perine years and males at 10. Every three to four years in the spring, females will migrate as upriver as their large bodies can bring them before laying tens of thousands of eggs in a single spawning, with the eggs being guarded by her mate. The dad will stay behind and watch his young hatch, some of which he does eat to ensure he survives the growth of the young. At the same time, he'll make sure nothing else gets close to the egg site, and will attack anything else around aggressively, sometimes dying in the process. Afterwards, the males will guide their young downriver and stay with them for another lunar cycle or two before running out of fat reserves and leaving the young to survive on their own. This extended parental guidance allows many of the fish to survive their first year, but not many will make it to sexual maturity given the harsh seas. This allows the species to become absolute titans, with the largest females being around 6 meters long and weighing 600 kilograms. Salmon, another iconic fish that migrate into rivers to spawn, also thrive in this region. Specifically, the sharp-toothed salmon is the salmon species that dominates the southern seas, just like how the Chinook salmon, their ancestor, patrol the Alaskan waters of Earth. As adults, these salmon thrive off of eating other fish and migrating to warmer waters in the winter. When these fish become old enough, they will return to the rivers that they hatched in, spawn ridiculous amounts of eggs, and soon afterwards die off. The fry will hatch and make it down river in a time rush, as they have to grow large enough to live in the salty seas before the winter comes in. Unfortunately, given the harsh conditions this far south, many amphibians and reptiles would not thrive down here. The darkness of winter and relative lack of places to migrate away to escape the cold via land means that most of these large exothermic creatures would likely die and not establish a population. On the other hand, just like almost every environment we see today, birds can be found thriving. These adaptable modern theropods find no exceptions here and can also be found here in great diversity just like how they are adapted to on Earth. First, covering the more cosmopolitan species seems to be most important, as one can see the requirements that an animal may need to survive in a specific environment. One such global species is the peacock head, a duck not too different from their wood duck ancestors. They can be found almost anywhere on the planet during this time period, from the tropics down to the polar regions. They can essentially be found anywhere where clean and fresh bodies of water can be found. They are omnivores, eating anything they can catch in the waters. A key adaptation that differentiates them from their ancestors is their sexual dimorphism. 
Males have an extravagant crest of feathers on their heads, with red eye spots that make them attractive to females of their species. Males with the most colorful heads get the attention of females, but to the point of their own detriment, as their colorful nature makes them stick out like a sore thumb. This is especially true in the polar regions of the planet, such as South Lucindo. The false rails are also a cosmopolitan species, and have many similar adaptations to the peacock head. They thrive best in swamps, bogs, and wetlands, but some populations thrive in southern Lucindo, especially in the summer months. Whilst their wings and musculature don't make them the best flyers in terms of speed, they are great at covering long distances, and groups of the species will migrate regularly. Given their slow flight, they are often blown off course, which has allowed them to colonize many islands of Prius and introduce them to new environments where they can exploit more resources. The false rails nest on the ground in a large social group called a supple, and the supple will collectively guard a nest site as one group, chasing off anything that might come their way with surprising levels of confidence. Being adaptable omnivores and having very generalist lifestyles, these birds are some of the most common ones to spot at this time period in any habitable terrestrial environment. Despite these adaptable birds thriving almost anywhere on Parias, some other birds have specialized to fit in well with this region specifically. One of these birds is the leaf duck, finding itself anywhere in southern Lucindo where plenty of trees and insects are found. They are mostly arboreal creatures and are generally poor flyers. Their limited flight is because of their dietary shift towards leaves and insects in the trees which is very low in caloric value. They often don't swim like their ancestors do, but sometimes come to the water to catch something to supplement their diet. They will also eat evercreep tomatoes when given the chance. Another bird that has adapted for a mostly followerverse lifestyle is the massive, dazzling zimu. Persisting across southern Lucindo from the temperate grasslands down to the polar region, these birds have become the largest birds on the planet to ever fly. Weighing around 50 kilograms and with a wingspan of around 4 meters, they are ginormous when compared to their ancestors. One may ask how or why they have adapted to becoming this large, and the answer to both comes in their diet. They spend the majority of their time eating tubers and grasses, migrating in huge herds from location to location, wherever resources are low. These animals have the ability to still fly despite their large size, due to the lower gravity of Parias, being 90% of Earth's. This lower gravity enables larger creatures to fly than Earth ever could. However, sometimes these animals can be vulnerable when on full stomachs when ambushed by a predator. They do have a capacity to fight back, with strong muscular legs and a nasty bite, but these defenses are no match for some of the predators in the region. The turquoise hair jay may not be as impressive as their larger competition in the region, but their adaptive lifestyle, relatively high intelligence, and small size allows these birds to carve out a niche for themselves in such a diverse yet harsh climate. On top of this, the species has adapted a unique mating system and migratory pattern that allows them to bypass the worst parts about living on this far south on the continent. When autumn comes along, males will show off their bright bluish-green feathers to attract a mate, and when one is impressed by their display, the pair will fly off together northwest to the subtropical lands of West Lucindo, and will raise chicks there together. In the spring, the pair and their young will fly back to their homeland and soon afterwards split up, starting the cycle all over again. Whilst many of the birds in this part of the world are omnivorous, adapting to be generalist enough to eat any resource they can find, some have not adapted this way. The elder owl is the descendant of the snowy owl and is a true sight to behold. With a lack of eagle and hawk competition in the area, this owl has adapted to not only hunt in the dark of the night, but also attack in the middle of the day. This adaptation was required in this region as the midnight sun in the summers of this region means that there is much of the year where the owl would be unable to hunt 
or have very little time to complete a hunt. They have retained the noise-canceling wing feathers of their ancestors alongside their mostly white coloring. The retained feature of white coloring is helpful even in the summers due to the dominance of aspen forests in the region, keeping white coloration beneficial even without snow. These owls got to take advantage of this feature, adapting shorter but wider wings perfectly adapted for the dense forests that they call home. Their wing shape is great for maneuverability, allowing them to stealthily ambush prey in the region. Mice, squirrels, small birds, and pretty much anything smaller than them is at their mercy. Unlike their ancestors and other owls, which are generally not very bright, these owls have slightly higher intelligence to more easily maneuver through the forest. The intelligence of this predatory bird has led it to a unique situation. Depicted in the image is an elder owl combating a false quoll, the descendant of the Virginia opossum. These animals often eat similar prey and end up competing for similar kills. Because of this, the two species have become bitter rivals and will try to kill each other if either is given the chance. Unlike the amphibians and reptiles, mammals have been the most successful group of animals that call this region home. Their adaptive heterodonty, fur, and live birth all are useful features that allow them to thrive in colder climates. Unlike birds, however, many mammals don't migrate out of the south in the winter as many of them, especially the smaller ones, have to walk around the mountains instead of fly. Despite being the smallest and humblest of mammals in the area, the black prairie mouse has unique behaviors and adaptations that allows them to do well in South Lucindo. As omnivores, they eat and chew through lots of materials, but they have a preference for insect larvae, given that they are excellent sources of fat and protein. They are the most prolific species around, as members of the species become fully grown within a single Parian lunar cycle. Because of this, their population booms in the spring and summer, given the rise of insects and fruits. In the autumn, these mice will build a massive nest made dozens or sometimes a hundred strong. The mice will huddle to keep warm for most of the winter, as they do not hibernate like many other species do at the time. Coming from up north, the minor marmot is an orangish red furred groundhog descendant that has a more fossorial and social lifestyle. Living in mostly monogamous pairs, the species builds extensive burrows underground and often intersect with other pairs. Despite having a single main mate, males and females alike of this species will often cheat on their mate with another. This can cause a more social cohesion among groups of minor marmots, as for males, any young of a nearby female could be potentially theirs. The young of these groundhogs will spend the first year of their lives in their parents' burrows, and will help their parents care for their younger siblings for a bit before being ejected to find their own mate and nest of their own. A close cousin of the ground-loving minor marmots is the more branch-climbing tree marmot, capable of moving greatly in the aspen trees that they call home. Being a semi-arboreal species, they don't often compete with the animals on the ground. They eat tubers, nuts, and leaves, and have short gray fur. Like their close relatives, they are monogamous, but unlike the minor marmots, they don't cheat nearly as commonly on their mates. These marmots aren't the only animals that specialized in climbing trees here, and share the arboreal stage with the big-eared squirrel. The big-eared squirrel is a unique descendant of the eastern gray squirrel that has adapted for an insectivorous lifestyle. Their fur is thicker, which makes stings and bites from insects hard to do. Their large ears grants them a great level of hearing sensibility, so sensitive that the squirrel can hear insects in the wood of trees. On top of that, their sharper incisors allow these squirrels to quickly catch and dispatch any insect prey that they find in the trees or on the ground. These traits make the squirrel have an equal matchup with the massive fur spider, which is a risky encounter for both species. The minor marmots and the big-eared squirrels have to keep an eye out, 
as one of the animals that will readily eat them is the false quoll, an opportunistic mesocarnivore that does just as well in the trees as they do on the ground. These marsupials are the descendants of the Virginia opossum, and took the vacant role of arboreal predator that would have been claimed by felids if they were brought to Parias. Their bodies have adapted well to being arboreal and better at eating meat. Their hands are clawed with opposable thumbs, a stronger tail, and sharper premolars. They will eat anything they can find, but often prefer ambushing rodents and birds unfortunate enough not to pay attention to their surroundings. These opossum descendants are also more relentless than their ancestors, using this behavioral adaptation in tandem with thicker fur and a layer of fat to pick fights and often deter larger animals away from kills. Coming back down to the ground, another species of small mammal that has adapted to this frigid bioregion is the quilled lemming. The quilled lemming is an especially fluffy descendant of the lemming that, like other mammals of the region, dig burrows. Without the snowy burrows, in the summer these animals rely on their hard, hedgehog-like hair that is a nuisance to large predators. Despite their hardening hairs that make them annoying to eat, it doesn't make it impossible, so these mammals are still frequent prey to elder owls and snow jackals. Going from one of the smallest mammals in the region to the largest, we witness a woolly bison male in his prime. Weighing around 1,350 kilograms and three and a half meters long, a migrating woolly bison herd is no laughing matter. With dense, thick fur, and a chambered nose, these bison are the most cold-hardy herbivores in the whole region. Their large heads and forward-facing horns allow for these mammals to easily dig through snow, but also defend themselves from predators, especially when healthy and fully grown. Few animals are bold or stupid enough to hunt a male such as the one depicting the image in his prime. Mating seasons in the species starts at the end of summer, with a calf born at the end of winter. The calf gets a whole summer to grow, and often weigh over 200 kilograms when the next winter rolls around. The calf will stay with her mother until she gives birth again, at which she sends the older child away. The rather hilariously named Mocking Behind is a deer descendant that lives more north of this region, but frequently comes down to feed on the foliage down in South Lucindo in the summer. These white-tailed descendants have adapted fast hair growth and gain their name from their rather hairy bottoms. Males and females have large eye spots on their tails and rear end and can often confuse predators. When a predator attacks their tail, the predator often ends up with nothing more than a mouthful of nutrient-poor hair. This deer is also faster and more nimble than their ancestors, allowing them a good chance to run away from predators that see through their natural deception. Another deer descendant that has adapted for this region is the Great Crowned Stag, one of the largest cervids of Prius. Eating grasses, leaves, and the occasional shine shroom, these giant creatures thrive in the lush summers of this region. In the winters, they stick around by having large fat storages on a hump on their back, similar to camels in shape and function. On top of this, their shovel-shaped antlers allow these reindeer descendants to dig through the snow in the dark of winter to find grasses, fungus, and other plant material that gets most of them through the darkness. They live in massive herds dozens strong, being groups of harems of one to two males with every six to seven females. Males have larger antlers and will often defend their mates when attacked, sometimes leading to their own death in the process. Whilst not as imposing as the great crowned stag, these deer have a unique friend in the shadows. The spotted pronghorn is smaller and less dangerous than the crowned stag. It has smaller permanent horns instead of antlers that regrow yearly. Despite this, they often find themselves in the herds of these massive deer. Why is this? Well, this is an excellent case of niche partitioning. Two species that fill the same niche in an environment will compete with each other, and this usually ends in one species outcompeting the other into extinction. However, when the species specialize in doing different niches in an environment, both groups can live in harmony. 
The crowned stag and the spotted pronghorns are great examples of this. The spotted pronghorn are faster, more gracile, and have better senses. The crowned stag are slower, larger, and have more impressive weaponry. Due to their unique strategies for survival, these mammals are able to survive in the same environment without one outcompeting the other. However, this has taken a step further in these two species, as their abilities are complementary when combined. Spotted pronghorns have better senses, and crowned stags have bulk and can dig better in winter. Because of this, many herds have both species coexisting together, with pronghorns being like scouts, warning a herd of a nearby predator. And predators are abundant in this region. The hellbite boar is an unexpected predator, especially for those who do not know what pigs are capable of. The descendant of feral hogs, these more carnivorous sewids resemble the extinct hell pig, although that is not particularly a pig, but that's a story for another time. Weighing a whopping 200 kilograms with a large head, their jaws are incredibly muscular. This allows them to make a dangerous bite that will make them a nightmare to encounter, especially when angry. Given their longer legs, they will chase prey when they think they got a chance, and sometimes will take down pronghorn or inexperienced snow jackals when given a chance. Females and males alike are both territorial, with females larger and more aggressive than males. She will chase away males that she deems unsuitable in the breeding season, but will often mate with multiple males, resulting in her litters of hoglets often having multiple fathers. This allows her to gain maximum genetic diversity in her young. Speaking of snow jackals, these canids are the only one of their ancestral family to colonize the cold lands. Despite their large size and pack hunting nature, these are not wolves. They are actually the descendants of foxes, as wolves and coyotes never happen to come down south to hunt, instead staying further up north, where many prey of theirs resided. They have evolved longer legs, with wide paws that make traction on any environment easy, especially snow in the winter. They have smaller ears to prevent frostbite, so many rely on sight and smell to find potential prey. Their fur, instead of being a magnificent orange like their ancestors, has become slightly muted in coloration for better camouflage. Weighing 50 to 60 kilograms, they on their own might not be much, but a pack of five to seven of them can be a very intimidating force. Their long snouts, sharp canines, and premolars also help to make them very threatening predators, especially for the pronghorns and the great crowned stags. However, even these intimidating carnivores fear something else. Weighing 700 kilograms and standing over 3 meters tall when on their hind legs, the bone break bear is truly an animal feared by all. The descendant of a hybrid bear, these monstrous animals have a combined set of traits from their grizzly and polar bear ancestors. Like grizzlies are known to do in some parts of the world, these bears will go into rivers to catch salmon before they spawn. They take things a step further by going into the water and catching large gobies or eels when salmon aren't spawning. They retain the ancestral hypercarnivory of their polar bear ancestors, eating very little plant material. Their fur is mostly an off-white color, interrupted by brown splotches on the face and extremities, both a unique set of stripes on the main part of the body. This breaks up their outline, especially in the stands of aspen trees as they often stay in the forests waiting for prey to come along. They prefer ambush tactics, but will rush down a herd of deer, or even woolly bison if separated from their herd. Whenever they can, they will push snow jackals off of their kills, which never goes well for the jackals, as the bear can often outweigh the entire pack combined. These bears will primarily dispatch their prey using their jaws, in a similar fashion to the hellbite pig, but take things a step further. Their bite force is strong enough to shatter bone, and they use this for both hunting live prey and scavenging. This is unlike their snow jackal neighbors, which hunt by using their sharp teeth to cause blood loss in their prey. These bears, however, are always solitary. They will only tolerate another bear in their territory if it is to mate, and their territories are often massive. 
The variety of species covered in this video are most of the diversity of life found in this region, as not much else is adapted for the coldest place on the continent. However, these aren't the only animals that have evolved from the life abandoned by humanity 5 million years ago on this planet. In the next episode, we will travel northward to the Lucinden High Steppe and examine how animals have adapted to live in an isolated cold desert on an ancient mountain range. This video was not completed alone. Parias has always been a collaborative project, as anyone who so wishes can submit species to be added to the Parias canon. I wish to thank all the people who I had the pleasure of collaborating with for this project, and I wish to continue to do this as long as I can. If you so wish to develop animals for the project just like the people in this video have done, you could join the Discord server to do that, or to gain access to sneak peek content for future videos. If you don't want to do either of those, just liking and sharing these videos is more than I could ever ask for. More content of Parias will be coming soon, so that you might want to keep an eye out for future videos by subscribing and turning on notifications. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you all have a great day.